Today is August 31st, and this is William Michael of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. Everywhere in education, people talk about the importance of lifelong learning. Everyone, from public school teachers to university administrators, are always talking about how important lifelong learning is, how their schools are committed to lifelong learning, and so on. But when we look around, I mean, just look around at the adults in your life, we very rarely find anyone engaged in any significant way in lifelong learning. Sure, we might find people that watch YouTube videos and get wrapped up in political controversies, but that's not learning. That's just arguing. There's very little interest, or I should say this talk about lifelong learning never really materializes. It's just a popular topic that that sounds nice to talk about. But who really does it? Who really is devoted to lifelong learning. In this talk today, I'd like to explain why I think we have this disconnect between talk about lifelong learning and actual experience in lifelong learning. To begin with, I think the problem is is simple and practical. I think there's a simple problem, and it's that we have false ideas about what lifelong learning should look like. And because we have false ideas or unrealistic expectations about what lifelong learning should look like, it doesn't work out for us because we really don't have a sustainable realistic plan for lifelong learning. We often attach the idea to some specific activity like continuing college studies when we're 50 years old. So we've got to ask the first question, what does lifelong learning even mean? What what does it consist of? What should it look like? And so on. And we've got to be realistic because we're all in different circumstances and that that limits what we can do. We can walk around with all of this arrogant modern talk about how everyone is equal and we can all do whatever we want, but we know that that's not true because these different activities either cost money or they require time and leisure that we may not have. And so we can't do anything we want. We've got to have some realistic plan that's sustainable, and it's going to have to be individual. My plan for lifelong learning is not going to look like your plan for lifelong learning. So let's let's talk about this and try to gain some helpful understanding of what lifelong learning really means and how we can all pursue it as we should as individuals. There's one important passage in the Gospels that I always talk about where Jesus teaches us that expectations should be relative. Expectations for ourselves should be relative. Expectations for others should be relative. God's expectations for us are certainly relative. We know that because he tells us so. Jesus in the Gospel tells us, He to whom much is given, from him much is expected, and to whom less is given, less is expected. 
this truth that more is expected from those who are given more and less is expected from those who are given less is a real source of wisdom in this life. Anyone who boasts of being gifted in some way or having more than someone else places upon himself a responsibility to do more than those other people. And you can see why boasting is really pretty stupid unless you're willing to take up the burden of producing more. And surely, if you are given more, you're going to be held accountable for producing more than the people who you boast against, who you imagine or say have less than you. If you have more, then you need to produce more. And likewise, if in God's providence you have less, you're not to burden yourself with thoughts by comparing yourselves to those who have been given more. You're to be humble. You're to accept your circumstances and think about making the best of them, not comparing yourself to others, because the comparison is not necessarily a comparison of value or merit. It's a comparison of opportunity, of resources, and so on. And it's a comparison that really doesn't make much sense. So the first challenge that we have in thinking about lifelong learning is we've got to know who we are. We've got to know what we are. We've got to know our place in society. We've got to know what the expectations should be that we pursue or expect in any kind of education or learning. We've got to be realistic. We've got to know who we are, and we've got to develop a plan that makes sense of who we are, or makes sense for who we are. If we aim too high and are unrealistic, if we think more highly of ourselves than we ought, we're not going to be able to achieve any of those goals, and we're going to frustrate ourselves. And if we aim too low, we're going to waste ability and opportunities that we have, that God has provided for us. So we've got to be careful to figure out exactly who and what we are so that we can think justly and honestly about what we can and should do. And I'll illustrate this a little bit. When I was in college, I had the privilege of being trained as an SAT prep teacher by Princeton Review. I lived in central New Jersey. Princeton Review had a main office in Princeton, and I was able to uh, receive training as an SAT prep coach from Princeton Review. And it was really fascinating training. One of my favorite training programs I've ever participated in. I found it just so helpful, so interesting, and so effective. But as we went through the training, we learned the guarantee that Princeton Review makes to all of its students. It guarantees a rise in SAT score of 100 points. If you sign up for a Princeton Review SAT prep course as a high school student, Princeton Review guarantees that your score will go up 100 points. Guaranteed, or your money back, and it's expensive training. It's a pretty impressive guarantee, I thought, at the time, and it is. Guarantee to raise your SAT scores 100 points. Now, after we 
we talk about that, after we talk about the guarantee that your score will, ra will be raised 100 points if you study the Princeton Review SAT prep course, they clarify that and say, look, now we can't, we can't promise you a high score. We can promise to help you raise your current score. We can't promise you a high score, but we can help you raise your current score. So students start out by taking practice SATs, see where their scores are at, and then Princeton Review promises them, we can raise your score 100 points from where it currently is. And what we learned in Princeton Review is that students can generally be sorted into just three or four groups. And SAT scores are really considered more like classes of students. The, the exact score is not that significant because, because really the test can vary from one test to another. Points can go up and down as students take different tests. But what's significant is that students are sorted into classes based on their SAT score. So if we were to say, who are the elite students? The elite students would be those who score, let's say, over 1450. So 1450, 1500, 1560, and perfect scores. Those are all the elite students. And if you go to the Ivy League schools, if you go to the top schools in America and look at their incoming freshman SAT scores, you'll see that that's who they are. Those scores, 1,400 and up, those are the elite students. That's, that's the upper class of college prep students. Usually, a student of that class who takes the SAT on his own will score in the upper 1300s or into the 1400s. He'll be at that level already before he receives any coaching. And that's what's important to understand. Then there's a second level, which is from, let's say, 1100 to 1400. So in the 1100s, 1200s, 1300s. These are strong, college-ready students. These are not the elite, but these are strong, college-ready students. These students may not get admitted into the Ivy League schools, but they can easily gain admission into the best public universities, top colleges, 1100s through the 1300s. These students will already be scoring in the 11 and 1200s on their own before they need any coaching from the Princeton Review. And the Princeton Review promises that they can get them up into the next bracket of hundreds. Then you have the group from, let's say, 800 to 1,000 or so. These are students who are not going to get admitted into selective colleges, but they can get admitted into your more average state university, small college, um, freshman classes. And their desire through this SAT prep coaching is to get up into the 1200s if possible. If they're floating around 1000, maybe they can get up into the mid to upper 1100s and sort of guarantee admission to a better school. And then you've got the kids below 800, which j just really don't have college prep skills, college-ready skills. And they're probably not thinking about going to college anyway. Now, the reason why I'm talking about this is because one of the hard realities for parents and for students when they begin talking with an SAT prep coach, one of the hard realities is coming to grips with the fact that they're not going to get the score 
that they might desire. A student who's got an 1150 on a practice SAT is not going to get a 14 or 1500. And it's hard for students to understand that. Hard for parents sometimes who have high aspirations for their children to understand that they're not going to raise their score 300 points. It's just not going to happen. Now, once that realization sets in, the student, if he accepts that, can prepare a strategy to raise his score significantly, but it's usually going to be around 100 points. And maybe if he has time, he can study more and continue practicing and raise it in another year, another hundred points. But he's, he's set in a class, and in order for him to succeed and get the best score he can, he needs to accept where he's at, accept the reality of where he's at, because the strategy for taking the test differs based on what group a student belongs to. And that's, that's what's really relevant for this topic here on lifelong learning. If you don't accept who and what you are, the reality of who and what you are, if you don't accept that reality, you will not be able to develop a successful strategy to gain the most learning possible because the plan has to be realistic. It has to be sustainable. And if you don't accept who and what you are, you'll end up trying to do things that you're never going to sustain. And you're just going to accomplish nothing. You're going to start and stop a million different programs, pick up books, leave them unfinished, start courses, drop out, sign up for programs, stop attending, and so on. If your expectations, if your self evaluation is not realistic, you're going to end up accomplishing nothing. And you would have accomplished more if you simply thought about yourself honestly and set realistic expectations. Now again, college admission illustrates this very clearly for us. When we think about the different kinds of colleges that exist, we think about the Ivy League schools, we think about the top public universities. You know, I went to a pretty good one, Rutgers University, but there are some public universities that are really first class, like the University of Michigan, University of Washington. There are some state universities that are among the top 10 or 15 colleges in the country that rank right among Ivy League schools. University of California has several different schools that uh, rank in the top 20. So there are Ivy Leagues, and then there are top public universities, and then there are your average public universities, and then there's a million small schools. And they all serve a different purpose. And if they're used well, they can all be a part of a successful strategy for college studies. I'll give myself as an example again. I was not a good high school student. I was bright, but I did not work in high school. I was an honor student, very intelligent, but I only was at school for the sake of sports and goofing around. I had a 2.3 GPA in high school, but I scored a 1340 on the SAT, which was very good. And so I remember when we got our first SAT scores back, might have been a 1320. We got our SAT scores back, and I remember everyone looking at their scores and asking around, what'd you get, what'd you get, what'd you get? And I, I really didn't even know what I was looking at. And I remember telling my teacher and my classmates that I got so much on the math section and so much on the verbal section and their jaws dropped because I was a goofball in high school. 
that was the first time that I recognized my potential. And I remember my teacher shaking her head at me, looking at me like, oh, if you would only use your gift, if, on, if you would only work and make use of your potential, you could really do great things. And that was the first time, when I saw my SAT score, that was the first time I said, I really need to take school serious because I, I can qualify to go to the best school and yet here I am with a 2.3 GPA. And so I was denied admission to Rutgers University because of my grade point average. I had teachers who refused to write me recommendation letters because they knew that I didn't try hard. And so I had to eat that humble pie as an 18-year-old and sit in an honors class with kids around me talking about all of the great schools they were going to. New York uh, University, Duke University, Princeton University, and I was going nowhere because of my grade point average. But I was the class clown, so I had to deal with that reality. In fact, my guidance counselor in high school told me that I should take seriously a, a career in stand-up comedy. So that's where I was at at 18 years old. But I learned my lesson, and fortunately, I was able to evaluate myself realistically and come up with a strategy. So I enrolled in a small college in New Jersey, Montclair State University. I went there my freshman year after getting denied admission by Rutgers. My girlfriend was admitted to Rutgers, so that was very embarrassing. But I went to Montclair State and I got good grades and I started to develop the disciplines that I needed. And I made good use of that small college simply for the sake of proving myself at the college level, and then I transferred into Rutgers University. And what's, what's telling is that once I got myself disciplined, got my priorities straight, got myself into Rutgers University, I then became a straight A student and ended up being admitted to Phi Beta Kappa. So it was just a matter of getting my head straight, being realistic about what I needed to do, and then getting to work with a strategy that was sustainable and realistic. So that small college, I would never recommend it for someone to go and get a final degree there unless that was the best that they could do and they were struggling to pass courses at that level. The, the college system in America really needs to be looked, like, looked at as a bunch of different options that can be used for one to climb up the ladder, as it were. But they've got to have a realistic plan. And again, at age 18, we're all sort of sorted into these different groups by our family background, by our family's emphasis on education, by our family's economic conditions, and so on. And so we're, we're sorted by these circumstances in our lives that we can't control. But then once we reach adulthood, we all become independent. We lose a lot of those advantages and disadvantages and the playing field through the first few years of adulthood sort of equalizes because it, it becomes a matter of merit. And a hardworking young person with a good plan can get ahead of a more blessed, highly supported student who doesn't make use of his or her advantages. And so there's this snapshot 
of all of us around age 18 that represents really our family life and the work that our parents did. These are the kids who get into Harvard. These are the the kids who get into Princeton and Stanford and Yale and MIT and Caltech and so on. They're really rewarded for the work that their parents did, for the opportunities their parents prepared for them and gave them. Not to deny the fact that those kids had to choose to listen to their parents, study hard, work hard, pursue lofty things, fulfill their potential. They had to do all those things, but the potential and the opportunity was provided for them by their parents. And that snapshot at age 18 sorts all of us into different groups. And we've got to evaluate ourselves and understand which group we belong to and why we're in that group. Once we're outside of that high school environment, once we're into adulthood, it's as if our lives start all over again. We now build our own lives. We now establish our own opportunities. We, by our work, by our prudence, develop our own advantages and disadvantages. Our vices introduce new disadvantages into our lives. Our virtues introduce new advantages. Many of us go through conversion experiences during that time of life, and we come out of that transition into adulthood as new creatures, totally different people. That's what happened to me at that point in my life. And so what I want you to to see with me is that We shouldn't allow that that first snapshot of ourselves when we're 18 years old or so to characterize us for the rest of our lives. Many people do that. Many people excuse themselves for not pursuing things or accomplishing things for the rest of their lives because of what they had accomplished at age 18. And it's really ridiculous and dishonest because once you're on your own, it's like life resets. And it's now a competition among independent young adults to see who makes the best of the next 10 years. And so we've got from, let's say, age 18 to 28, which most people associate with the college years, for undergraduate and graduate studies, the kids who worked the hardest and achieved the most during the high school years have to do it all over again if they're going to achieve the most in the college years or they're going to be surpassed by the kids who work hard from 18 to 28. And so at age 28, we've got a different hierarchy of achievers. The same kids who were achieving the most at age 18 are often not the the young adults who are achieving the most at age 28. Many who are achieving the most at 28 didn't look very impressive at 18. And so we go through these phases where it's as if the race starts over again. And we have a chance to race again. And then the same thing happens after that. In our post-college years, from like 30 through 40, again, it's another phase of life. And it's like another race. Who's the most virtuous? Who makes the best use of their time? Who makes the best use of their opportunities? Who continues to push forward and upward? Studying, working, learning, improving their discipline, and so on. It's race after race after race through each different phase of life. I wasted those K-12 to years and found myself at the back of the pack as an 18-year-old, but I made extraordinarily good use of the next phase of my life and from age 18 got ahead of many people. That's why I, 
I'm very proud. If there's one, if there's one achievement that I'm really proud of, it was being inducted into Phi Beta Kappa at the end of my college studies because that's a prestigious honor society. And I went from being denied admission to Rutgers University as an 18-year-old to being inducted into the university's Phi Beta Kappa chapter as a 26-year-old. And to this day, I consider that achievement to be one of the, the best of my life because it's a symbol of how I was able to turn things around as a young adult and still make it out at the top by that next phase of life. And then once I was at that phase, I went into my professional life, worked hard, went to work all day, continued studying at night, was researching and developing the classical liberal arts curriculum. And then in 2007, when I was 32 years old, I started the academy and have continued working and continued working. And now I'm 48 years old and I'm at a different phase of my life. And as I, I recently mentioned, I'm starting after many years away from university studies, I'm starting the pursuit of graduate studies and I'm doing so through the extension school at Harvard. And it's the extension school at Harvard is just like a perfect symbol of my life. And it's what that extension school is for, what it was created for back in 1910. So anyway, that's a, a long introduction to the topic of lifelong learning. Because, as I said, we've got to look in the mirror and be honest and think about who we are, think about what resources we have, what we can do, what we need to do, what the priorities are, and so on. I watched my younger sister try to do in college what I did without the resources. And she tormented herself for years trying to go to college, trying to be like her brother. She tried and tried, but she just could never make it. She didn't have the money. She didn't have the support. She didn't have the time. And she tormented herself. Instead of looking at her own life and preparing a plan that would be good for her, she just tried to compete with me. And I had different circumstances. I had different intellectual gifts. I had the support of a girlfriend who was a college student. Lots of friends in college, Christian friends that encouraged me in my studies and so on. She needed to develop a plan for her life, and she never did so. She just always tried to compete and ended up never accomplishing anything and being worse off in the end than she would have been had she just understood who she was and what was realistic for her and stuck to that plan. So that's the first challenge is understanding who and what you are. Understanding what you can do, understanding what you can't do. A lot of this has to do with family members. If you've got a, a spouse, for example, if you're a husband and you've got a wife and children, you've got to take care of them first. So that determines what you can and can't do. If you're a wife and you've got a husband, and you, you've got obligations to them to fulfill first. Those are moral duties. And you've got to take care of them. There's, there's, no, there's no lesson you need to learn that's more important than fulfilling your own moral duty. So for all of us, the first thing we've got to ask is, what are my moral obligations? What are my duties to the people already in my life? And we've got to make sure we fulfill those duties. And if we want to pursue learning... We're going to have to do it at our own expense. We can't make someone else suffer for it. I can't say to my children, sorry kids, you know, I'm going to pursue 
these studies and the only way I can afford to do so is by cutting all your allowances and not buying any Christmas presents, not helping you in your own studies. I, we can't do that. We can't make other people sacrifice things that they deserve for us to pursue our own plans. We have to have a realistic, sustainable plan. And it's often difficult to do that. And that's one of the reasons why people fail is because they're ambitious and they're eager, but they're impatient. And so they come up with plans that are unsustainable. So you have a person who doesn't pray, and what does he resolve? He resolves that he's going to pray the entire Liturgy of the Hours every single day, the whole rosary, you know, all three sets of mysteries, and he ends up praying none. That's how many people pursue their devotional life, their contemplative life, their intellectual life, and so on. The silliness of unrealistic expectations leads to no achievement at all. And so if we're realistic, we can develop a plan that's sustainable. And that's what a wise person would do. With no thoughts about what other people are doing, no pressure from what other people are doing. Because remember, to whom much is given, much is expected. They're just doing what they should. And to whom less is give, given, less is expected. And we've got, to, we've got to embrace what we are. That's not an excuse to do less. It's a challenge for us to be realistic. Because if we're not going to be realistic, we're going to end up doing less than we should. Not more, less. We've got to look at things like finances and be realistic. We've got to be realistic about what we can and can't do. Do we have finances to pursue formal studies, let's say at a university? If we don't have the finances to do that, then that's not an option. And it's pretty ridiculous to have someone scrounge money together to say, oh, I'm going to go to graduate school. Well, graduate school is 48 credits. So if you can't afford, if you're not going to be able to afford 48 credits, what are you really going to do? If you're going to go to graduate school, the goal is to get a graduate degree. If you don't get the degree, the time and money spent at graduate school is a waste because you could have just studied privately. We go and enroll in a school to obtain a degree. We don't go and enroll in a formal school to simply study. We can study without any enrollment. So we've got to count the cost. We've got to think about what the goal is, what the costs of that goal would be, and think realistically if we're going to be able to do it. We've got to be realistic. So when we talk about lifelong learning, lifelong learning requires an individual plan, an individual plan for how I am going to pursue learning that I need throughout my life, from one step to the next step to the next step, while also continuing to manage all of my responsibilities. It's a very virtuous life that allows for lifelong learning. And it challenges us, not with all these crazy plans about all these crazy sacrifices we're going to make or we're going to work full time and study full time and take classes at night and work an overnight job. A lot of that talk is ridiculous. It's not going to happen. We've got to have realistic plans. We've got to have realistic plans. Usually, usually, we're trying to do four things and we're only capable of doing three. And we've got to figure out which one of those four things we're going to give up. For example, if you like to sit around and play video games, I don't know how you're going to manage, 
I don't know what else you're going to sacrifice so that you can keep your video games and pursue learning. What are you going to give up? Work for learning? Are you going to give up family relationships? Are you going to give up worship and prayer? Obviously, if there's one ball that you need to take out of the bucket so that learning can fit into the bucket, it's going to be video games, or it's going to be watching sports, or it's going to be playing sports, and so on. We've got things in our lives that we like to do which aren't necessary, and what makes them bad is not the things themselves. They're not intrinsically evil in any way, but they're not the best thing that we could do. They're not the best thing. And when we consider that we choose to do something inferior, that's what makes it, to a degree, bad for us. Because the attachment to that thing, the attachment to that activity or hobby or whatever it is, has taken the place in our bucket of available time and resources that something better could have taken instead. And for most people, that's what keeps them back from any learning. They just waste too much time with other stuff. It could be something that appears good, like exercise. I could exercise four hours a day easily and love every minute of it. I've got to discipline myself to not exercise as I would like to, because there are simply nobler things for me to devote myself to. There are some people who exercise every single day for hours, and it's, it's great for their bodies that they do so. They, they may be in great physical shape, and that's great. But there's more to life than the condition of our bodies, and it becomes a choice we've got to make. It becomes a choice we've got to make. And if we're not willing to sacrifice that thing, then we just need to stop talking about these other plans and idle dreams we have because we're not, we're not realistic. So when we look at our lives, we don't have to come up with some crazy plan. Usually there's stuff in our life, wasted time, poor scheduling, a lack of simple discipline in a daily schedule, hobbies and other recreational activities that take up a lot of time, maybe even take up a lot of money, that could be sacrificed and replaced with something better. We may have the money to pursue some formal studies. We may have the time for some great achievement to be pursued. And this again brings us back to the reality that this is an individual issue. Nobody can make these decisions for us. We've got to examine ourselves, look at our lives, look at what we're doing, and ask ourselves, the way that I'm living, the things that I'm doing, is this the best version possible of myself? Or could I be better by making some changes? Could I be better? I like to think ahead to the future. I like to think ahead and say to myself, when I'm 55 years old, when I'm 55 years old, what will I wish I had done when I was 48 years old? I used to think like that when I was 20 years old. I used to think, when I'm 40 years old, what will I wish that I had done when I was 20? And I tried to make decisions in my life as a 20-year-old that I would be glad I made when I was a 40-year-old. So it's good to motivate ourselves, it's, it's helpful for deliberation in these issues to think ahead. 
Because we often, especially when we get into our 40s, we start to think it's too late. But that's really dumb. And I'll, I'll give you an example from my own life recently. When I, when I realized, my wife and I were talking, and I realized, like, I'm in a position in life right now. My kids are in college. They're all doing well. Their tuition is paid for. I really don't have much obligation towards them because they're taking care of themselves very well. Our work in education is prosperous, even though we're being generous with free enrollment, low-cost enrollment, on and on. We have the resources and the time and the opportunity for me to pursue formal studies. And I started to think about it and think, you know, I'm 48 years old. Is it really worth it, you know, to go to, let's say, graduate school and pursue a master's degree at 48 years old? Is it really worth it? And I went back and forth on it and I, you know, think to myself, that's, that's a waste of time. Why, why would I do that? If it took me four years to finish a master's degree, I'd be 52 years old. What am I going to do with a master's degree at 52? I'm not, I'm not looking for a career change. I'm not applying for jobs anywhere. What am I really going to do? And I started to think about the numbers. And I thought, you know, I got my degree when I was like 26 years old. It took me a little longer because I changed majors and had to pay for it myself. It took a little longer. I got my degree when I was like 26. But I was already teaching full time, so it really didn't matter. So if you think from 26 to, to the present, it's about 20 years. So I've had my college degree for 20 years. If I got my master's degree when I was 52 and continued to live and work in education until I was 72, that would be 20 years. That's a long time. And we don't tend to think of it like that. That's a long time. From 52 to 72 is 20 years. If God wills and I live, that's a long time. Why would I not consider getting an advanced degree? And of course, as time goes on, I'm going to get weaker. I'm not going to be able to work with the intensity and put in the hours that I do presently. So I'm going to have to think about how I could be useful to my family, how I could be useful to the Catholic community and so on when I'm 65 years old, 70 years old. I don't want to talk about retirement. I want to talk about continuing to be useful and helpful and productive and capable of, of earning a living even when I'm in my 60s and into my 70s. So of course I could make good use of a graduate degree Especially, as I said, if I pursue one from Harvard through the Extension School, of course I could make good use. And of course there would be plenty of time to make use of such studies and the degree and, and then all the benefits of being a member of a Harvard alumni community and so on. There'd be many benefits, many things worth pursuing. And it took me time to really deliberate on it and work through the details to realize that it, it certainly was a desirable thing. And for a number of reasons, it's feasible for me. It's not something crazy. It doesn't cause anyone around me to have to sacrifice anything. It's realistic at this point in my life. And it wasn't realistic three years ago or five years ago or when I was 25 years old. So I look at how I used my life from age 30 to 48, devoting myself to my life's work, to classical Catholic education, studying, working to develop my educational business, build the classical liberal arts curriculum, I think I made good use of those years, and I, and I studied things and learned things that I wouldn't go to a formal school for anyway. I also became a lay Dominican during that time. So I think I made good use of those years, doing what I could, 
making use of the opportunities that I had, and now finding myself with a different set of opportunities, it leads to different decisions. But I, I want you to see how my life's plan or my life's course has been unique. It's an individual pursuit. And that's what each of us needs to realize. We need to look at our lives and figure out what's the best thing for us to do right now. The best thing for you to do might be just to commit yourself to studying the Bible or to praying the Liturgy of the Hours or going to daily Mass. That may be the best thing for you to do at this point of your life. Some kind of formal study might actually not be the best thing to do. Just devoting yourself to your career, becoming an expert in your field, that might be the best thing for you to do right now. So we've got to look at our individual lives and we've got to ask, what can I do at this point in my life, in my present circumstances, to make the best use of my time resources, opportunities, and so on. In 20 years, what will I wish I had done at this point in my life? What can I do today while I have strength and energy and, and support and all these good things? What can I do today to prepare for and provide for what will be my weaker years? Those are the kind of thoughts we need to have, not anxious thoughts, not timid thoughts, which lead us to bad decisions, but responsible thoughts. Thoughts where we consider how we might work and make use of the present to avoid becoming a burden to anyone in the future. Those are not anxious thoughts, those are charitable and responsible thoughts. We need to have those thoughts while we're young and store up like an ant for the winter time of our lives. So all this talk about lifelong learning has to be woven into the details of our individual lives. Now in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, I've made it possible for Catholics or anyone to study the classical Catholic curriculum, to study philosophy and theology. I've made it possible to do that affordably, if not freely, throughout all of our lives. So for those subjects, there's no real need for any talk about formal schooling or college degrees or graduate degrees. If you're interested in pursuing classical studies, Catholic theological studies, and you're not concerned about getting a degree to, to do something with professionally, the Classical Liberal Arts Academy can, can be a source of lifelong learning for you. It's designed to be that. If there's a professional concern you have, you want to qualify yourself to possibly move into a a more influential position in the field you work in, or you want to simply improve your expertise and training so that you can continue to be innovative and competitive as time goes on, then formal university or um, college studies might be desirable. But it's, it's an individual thing. I also encourage Catholic laymen to look into third orders of religious communities, as I did with the Dominicans. There are many opportunities for lay Catholics to improve their spiritual life, improve their Catholic studies and devotion by becoming members of third order communities within the religious orders. There are third orders for the Benedictines, for the Dominicans, for the Franciscans, for the Carmelites. Consider third order 
religious community. So there's lots of options from simple private studies all the way up to formal graduate degree programs. The only way that we can really succeed in lifelong learning is to have a realistic understanding of who we are, of what we are, of what we should be, of what we owe God with respect to the opportunities and resources he's provided us with, and what we can do within the limits of charity towards our family members and neighbors. We have to make a plan for lifelong learning that's based on our individual circumstances. And if we, if we set our expe expectations proudly and unrealistically, we'll just end up doing nothing. But we'll talk about all these things and just spin our tires or start and stop constantly, time and again, and, and usually waste a ton of money doing that and just and just become annoying everyone's tired of hearing of all your plans and you're going to do this and you're going to do that just do something simple be realistic be quiet do something simple get your feet under you and make some progress within your own circumstances complaining about things is unreasonable. Saying, oh, well, when I was in school... Nobody cares about when you were in school. You've been out of school for how many years? Nobody cares about your high school career. It's irrelevant. You're an adult now. You're independent. You're free. You've been free probably for years and years. Disadvantages you had as a 16-year-old have very little to do with your current circumstances. And if you think ahead, you can put yourself in a position in 10 years that could be much better than others because you've made better use of those 10 years. But you've got to have a realistic plan that is beneficial for your own life. And, and only you can make that plan. Only you can do that. Now, I'm happy to be considered a friend if you'd like to think through your opportunities, if you'd like to bounce an idea off someone and get some feedback, I'm happy to do that. I know sometimes we just need to... Sometimes I talk to my wife and I really don't have any interest in hearing what she has to say. I just need somebody to talk to. I just need, I need to think through things out loud. And just bounce my ideas off her. And before she even responds, I can already feel myself coming to the answer. Sometimes we just need someone to talk to for our own sake. So I'm happy to do that. If, you've, if you'd like to think about your options, or maybe you don't know what your options are, and you've got yourself in certain circumstances where you think you might be able to do something, but you just don't know the details of the options, I'm happy to discuss those things with you. Um, so feel free to write to me. But I hope you find this helpful. And remember, you know, write this verse on your desk or put it on the fridge. To whom much is given, much is expected. To whom less is given, less is expected. There's no pressure. There's no pressure on you to compete with others. The pressure is simply to compete with yourself to make yourself better and to give to God the fullness of your potential. That's the goal. And if you can keep that mindset and stay positive and just mind your own business, don't worry about what anyone else is doing. Just mind your own business, stay positive, and focus on getting better little by little, bit by bit, and multiplying that improvement by thousands and thousands of days, tens of years, you can make significant improvement in your life and really achieve great things with a realistic plan for lifelong learning. I hope that's helpful. Feel free to get in touch. God bless.